We are welcoming you all to our Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts, Momentum, the Natural World Online Festival. And um, we just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm Amy Sawyer, Associate Curator, and it is my honor to welcome also our special guest, Aisha Harrison. We would like to begin in acknowledging that the land we are gathered on is within Aboriginal territory of the Squab people of clear salt water. Expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers. The Squab live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Squab live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We pay respects to their elders past and present. BIMA's mission is to inspire curiosity, wonder, and understanding by connecting people with the contemporary art and craft of the Puget Sound region. We aim to create a culture of inclusion with respect for who is telling the story and whose story is being told. We aspire to help build a more equitable world and fight against systemic racism and stand in solidarity with those who are fighting for justice. This year, BIMA Momentum Series is centered on the natural world, an online festival of art and ideas and it's free lectures and panels and conversations which inspire, empower, and educate through the art. We are grateful for the generosity of our members and donors, as well as the Prison Fund for making this festival possible. We are excited to be bringing this program with you, um, to, so staying informed and about upcoming events on our website at biartmuseum.org. If you enjoy this afternoon's programming, please consider becoming a member and we're just so grateful for the support of our members and donors. The first part of our program is a presentation from Aisha Harrison in about, I believe about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, we're excited to welcome you and share these stories and insights. Uh, different perspectives and truths in order to ensure a positive experience for both our audience and our presenters. So we ask that you come ready to listen um, with openness and learning uh, that comes with it at all. It's just show respect for those who are all here um, and participating. So we're inviting you to listen, comment, ask questions along the way by using your chat button. And note that the webinar format is only the panelists are visible and we will be recording for this event for a future viewing. So I'm really glad that this afternoon we have Aisha Harrison, whose exploration is like has many threads of visual identities relating to rituals of deep connections to ancestral currents centered in the medium of clay. Aisha discovered clay in a community studio while working toward a degree in Spanish at Grinnell College in Iowa. After graduating, she spent some time teaching in Atlanta, Georgia, and continued to explore clay at Collinwold Fine Arts Center in Georgia and Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. Aisha went back to school and received a BFA from Washington State University and MFA from University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Aisha is from Olympia, Washington here with us today and has deep roots going back four generations. Through Aisha's study of Latin American literature, as she is intrigued by the ways in which indigenous people used Spanish stories and images subverting them and intertwining them with their own to ensure that indigenous people's images and stories survived. So these camouflage acts of resistance reminded Aisha of ways that 
to, she navigates being of African American and European American mixed heritage in predominantly European American spaces. Her work is shown nationally with uh, recent work at Bay and Museum of Art with us and the storefront window project in downtown Olympia. It's a, a recent collaboration project um, under the name Blackwell Red Thread Collective. Uh, Aisha's co-founded in 2020. And she also has work at the Leonore R. Fuller Gallery at South Sound Community College and has done residencies at Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts, Women's Studio Workshop, and Baltimore Clayworks. She's also taught workshops, courses, programs at BEMA and Penland School of Crafts, the Evergreen State College, Bicota Senior Center, the Baltimore Clayworks, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and the Lux Center for the Arts. And I was first introduced to I Aisha's work in 2018 through a coworker. I was immediately struck by her connection and, and keen sensitivity to the medium of clay. That it's it, her story is deeply embedded. It's personal. It's emotional. It's spiritual, and it was just in such an honor in 2019 to invite her to share a, a vignette of clay works in the Face First group exhibition, uh, which focused on. Uh, emphasizing the face in portraiture and exploration of identity. This uh, program truly underscores part of BEMA's mission to stay connected with artists in the Puget Sound region and support their journey story. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the formulation of Aisha's recent projects and she's embarked upon this next path of working with clay to bronze and you know it's just each step is bearing witness to the the nature that is surrounding us here in in the Puget Sound region and um, just connecting it to the power of place and what that really means to us and so thank you so much for being with us today and I will just let you take it away Hi everybody, uh, my name's Aisha. Thank you so much for that um, very generous uh, introduction, Amy. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to Bima and uh, Kristen and Hunter for your support in getting this um, program going. So I really appreciate it. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, my slide talk. Hold on just a sec. I'm not super awesome at this. So just take me a little extra second here. <laughs> okay, here we go. My usual slide talk starts with a slide like this, explaining that in my work, I investigate what it means to be of both African American heritage and European American heritage, that in my bloodlines, I hold both slaveholder and slave. In much of my work, I've held this fact at the center. I've also worked with other unfair advantages and privileges I am afforded, as well as my experiences, experiences with racism and massage au noir. On the right, there's an example of a piece that directly addresses these ideas. Here's another piece that I feel is similar to the previous one, but hints at what I will be talking more about in depth today. This talk is different than any talk I've ever given before. It expands on my relationship with the natural world and how it intertwines with ancestral healing, the experience of holding ancestral and current trauma and joy in my body, and how interconnected our collective survival is with the rest of our more than human ancestors and relatives. I use two processes extensively to develop imagery. I feel that the work I make is a collaboration between my conscious self, my subconscious self, and the greater collective consciousness of ancestors, both human and non-human. The processes I use are a method of guided journaling based on the Progoff Intensive Journaling Method developed by Ira Progoff and deeply influenced by Jungian psychology 
and touch drawing, developed by Deborah Koff Chapin. Both processes offer a space to drop down, drop in, or as Progoff calls it, go down my personal well. I allow myself to be in a state of openness during these processes, to let images and words come through without the constant filtration of my conscious mind. I have practiced this state of openness and it comes easily to me now, but it's something I have had to decide to do. When I write, I'm usually transcribing a conversation I'm having with some element or being or facet of a being. I speak to it and allow the space for it to speak back or show me things. When I touch draw, I create a large number of touch drawings, maybe 20 to 50 at a time, that aren't meant to be finished pieces. Instead, they're intended to be process images. I might start with a thought or question and then allow the images to come through without trying to control them. After the touch drawing part of a session, I will sit with the drawings and give them titles. To me, the titling process is as important as the drawings and often offers insights. Some of the drawings get developed further into finished drawings, carvings, or sculptures, or in some cases, all three. Some of the titles become poems or launch pads for dialogues or further drawing sessions. Here are a couple of examples of touch drawings that turned into a series of pieces, which you'll see later during this talk. Bodies in many forms are a consistent presence in my work. Beyond the human body, I use a clay body. I think about the earth as a body, bodies of water, and society as a body. I'm fascinated by the movement between internal and external bodies and in those transitions. The dropping down sensation feels like letting go and going inside a body space, like a womb or a cave that's generative humming with life and expansive. It's dark, mysterious, and beautiful. It has to do with searching, dreaming, drifting, observing, ancestors, and collaboration. When I get to the bottom of my well, there's almost always cave and always water. We are beings made up of approximately 60% water, with some estimates even higher. Our brains and hearts are made of 73% water, our lungs 83%, skin 64%, and even our bones contain 31% water. All living things need water. Water is actually life. That's not just a catchphrase. Water is also associated with the subconscious mind transformation, including baptism, and the emotions. I use pillow forms like this to explore 2D imagery as well as ideas for sculpture. This pillow form has the cave-like imagery with people or ancestors or spirits standing in the water. It came from an experience during a Progoff journaling session where I became water, and as water, swirled around and among my ancestors. I love big water. Big water rejuvenates and humbles me. I feel the most connected and held near big water and in the woods. Water is present throughout my work, often as the surroundings for the person in the image or implied like in the use of boats or salt. The carving on the left, titled Growing, was inspired by the touch drawing on the right. In the carving, you can see the water behind the person. Here are a few more pillow forms. The water's not merely in the background for me. 
It's an undercurrent, an actor in the story. Here are a few more examples that are either inspired by touch drawings or use the touch drawings as collage materials. These carvings are directly sourced from touch drawing and titles of touch drawings. This is an installation of the carvings, touch drawing, collages, and poems called collectively How It's Held. It is about the multifaceted experience of holding my heritage together in one body. These are two pieces from the SALT series. I used SALT to represent a residue of unearned privilege. Water was implied in this series by the boats. SALT also dissolves in water, so many of the characters tried to remove the SALT by using water or their own spit. Salt, of course, recrystallizes after the water evaporates, representing the futility of trying to erase the residue of privilege. This is a process photograph of a piece I am currently working on right now in my studio. I am calling it the Boat of Hands. It has my dad's, mom's, my child's, and my own hands. The idea came from a Purgoff writing session where I was water and my ancestors were all around with their hands in the water. These two boat images were printed together to evoke a connection between slave boats and the boats crossing the Mediterranean Sea with people fleeing war, environmental disasters, and persecution. Colonial practices, capitalism, and racism allowed and continue to allow dehumanization of people who are not of European descent. When I drop down, there is often a reoccurring image of bodies drowning from ancestors who jumped from the ships rather than becoming slaves, or those who were thrown off the boats for disobedience or illness. The bodies have a specific shape as they sink, similar to this manipulated photograph. In a recent touch drawing session, big leaf maple samaras inserted themselves and mingled with and replaced these bodies. The big leaf maple and its seeds, native to the Pacific Northwest, are offering me a space to reflect and learn. How are these beautiful seeds like my ancestors? How can these seeds and tree be a medicine for the ache I hold deep in my body as I remember these ancestors? How can this medicine also help move some of my ancestors' trauma? I'm currently working on pieces that incorporate the big leaf maple and the Samaras. Another tree that's inserted itself is the red alder, also native to the Pacific Northwest. I spied these red roots on a hike with my family a few years ago, and they have captivated me ever since. The red alder that grows near flowing water like rivers sends out these beautiful red roots that absorb water and nutrients from the rivers. They wiggle their way between the rocks and other bank materials and stick out into the flowing water. These stunning roots became an inspiration and medicine. I see them as roots, yes, but also veins and blood like that like the DNA and hair are long lines that connect us through time forward and backward. I'm part of a collective called Blackwell Red Thread Collective that I co-founded with Shamika Gagne and Coley Gladney in 2020. 
The alder roots and their association with blood and connections through time have manifested in much of our collective work. This piece was installed at South Sound Community College in the fall of 2020. There are 4,094 lines representing the number of human ancestors needed for one person going back 400 years, which is about 12 generations. The surface of the black well reflect the long line going on forever, our ancestors, us, and our descendants. On the right is a picture of my mother and my son looking into the well. The threads from the future blanket are now being woven into a blanket for our descendants 400 years from now in 2420. You can see one of my collective members, Shamika Gagne, weaving threads from that future blanket into the blanket that will be finished soon. In the background of the picture with the whole piece, you can see another one of my current works called To Name a Few. To Name a Few is an actively growing installation that honors Black women, girls, femmes, and trans folks. I've been making drawings centered, centering around an individual person's name that are like mon meditations, mandalas, or prayers. Some of them honor folks who have died at the hands of police. Others honor those who were alive or who have passed, but not directly as a result of state violence or police violence. The drawings are connected by black threads that show how we are interconnected. Although those threads aren't red, they perform a related function for me. My work deals a lot with ancestors, but that doesn't mean that it's all about the past. I want my work to live in the stream of good trouble that is pushing our country to reckon with its past and live up to its best ideals. I'm fascinated by other root systems besides the alder root as well. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I've been fortunate to be next to the tree roots that exist after the nurse log underneath them disintegrates. I am passing my fascination on to my son pictured on the right. For me, roots represent the way that trees stay grounded and stable. They get what the plant needs to survive and they communicate and cooperate to help other beings around them survive too. The image on the left has two sets of roots, one going down and the other reaching up toward the sky, towards the stars. The western red cedar is another one of the trees that I feel deeply connected to. It is native to this area and is, an, and is a sacred tree to many peoples. I often combine cedar trees with roots that go deep down, even though cedar roots grow more shallowly and spread out wide. I feel the roots are symbolic for the connection to the land, to the earth, and to us. Ancestor One represents the connections to both my human and my more than human ancestors. You can see the cedar trees again, as well as the horns of an animal. In general, for faces, I search through reference books that have photographs of black people from various time frames, looking for faces that resonate with me. I use elements of their faces in combination with my known ancestors, myself, and my descendants, in acknowledgement that many of my ancestors and descendants are unknown. I feel this gives the face a sense of time. I often reflect on how one of my eyes belongs to my ancestors and the other is mine. I feel a responsibility to be the very best future ancestor possible, as well as working to heal my ancestors' trauma through this work. These are some images from a window installation by the Blackwell Red Thread Collective called Starbridge to Your Door. We each made elements that combined into a window display that was in downtown Olympia in 2020. We used Ancestor One as part of that installation. 
You can see there's also red threads and salt and references to trees, the moon, stars, portals, and bridges. The salt in this piece was used as a purifier, as well as alluding to mountains and clouds. The horns in Ancestor 1 come from my affinity toward our more than human ancestor, the rhino. Rhinos showed up down in the well many years ago and are almost always there. They are gentle and strong, grounded, playful, and resilient. Unfortunately, most kinds of rhinos are on the brink of extinction because of human activity. Several types only exist inside of animal preserves due to hunting, poaching, and habitat loss. Some of the more than human ancestors that are closer to home are the Pacific salmon. I was a salmon watcher for the Nisqually tribe a few years ago and observed the salmon in Shinanam Creek, also called McAllister or Medicine Creek. I went several times a week for six months. I was overwhelmed when I was told in the training that at least 137 species directly depend on salmon for survival, humans included, and in particularly the people who are the orig original inhabitants of this amazing land that we stole. There are species dependent on salmon in the open ocean, estuaries, and freshwater, and range from plants and trees, to insects, to birds, to mammals. The salmon's nutrients are so vital that if there are not enough salmon carcasses in a river, people will throw extra carcasses into that river in what's called a salmon toss. Salmon are an indicator species as well, which means that their success indicates the success of other species, including our own. This piece represents a prayer for the salmon of Shinanam Creek. The piece is pictured in clay here, but I'm raising funds to get it turned into bronze and displayed in a public place. The line coming out of the mouth follows the shape of the part of Shinanam Creek that I was observing. A few of the creatures and plants dependent on salmon are on that line. Cycles, life, death, interdependence, nutrients, and ancestors. Stars, and space. Reaching through the earth, upward with trees, downward with roots, suspended. This piece represents an ancestor who survived the journey across the Atlantic. This ancestor witnessed many things and survived them. Her bravery and joy and will to live is part of why I'm here today. This piece needs to be placed in a very special place. I want to give this ancestor a beautiful home where she can rest and behold the sacredness of the Pacific Northwest. The marks on her back, reminiscent of scarification, represent graves. My hope is that viewers will want to touch those raised bumps to feel the texture. The gesture of rubbing her back can give her support, as well as offering remembrance for the people who died around her. The cavity below her ribs will grow moss and will need to be tended, like our relationship to land and ancestors of the past, present, and future. This piece is currently at the foundry being made into bronze. And I want to show you a few process shots here. Here's the mold being made of the torso. First, the mold is created by painting layers of silicone mold material and then coating, coating that in plaster to keep its shape. The torso was divided into several sections, which you can see are indicated by the ribs that stick out.
Next, wax is poured into that mold to make a wax copy of the original clay. The wax is carefully cleaned up to remove anything that wasn't in the original sculpture, like small pockmarks or seams. I'm doing a lot of that work in my own studio to uh, help save on cost. The wax parts are dipped into a liquid ceramic slurry many times to create a thick shell and covered with various grits of sand. This is called the investment process. The investment is placed in a kiln and the wax is melted out, which is where the name lost wax casting comes from. Then they pour the molten bronze into the investment which is what they're doing in the photograph on the left. After they have the bronze parts, they weld them back together and fix the seams if the piece was large enough to need to be in parts. After the metalwork work is complete, they apply the patina, which is what the guy's doing on the right. This piece is my very first bronze. I'm very excited to see the next one woman with graves at her back, completed in bronze. She will be placed on a plinth in downtown Olympia later this year. After her incredible journey, she will finally have a place to rest by the Salish Sea. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. I think we're going to have a question and answer period now. I just wanted to give you a few ways to contact me for more information about my work, as well as the name of my GoFundMe campaign, which is still open for donations to get Shinanam Salmon Prayer turned into bronze. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, how do you, how do you feel? That's so. Oh. <laughs> uh, I love that it was pre-recorded. That was just so great for me. <laughs> <laughs> it really is uh, remarkable the work, how much work you've been doing over the years, and just this whole process. I know we have some digital questions rolling in, and um, I'm just if it's okay, I'm gonna kick it off with one I had in mind if that um, I was just thinking through through the conversation of ancestors and and um, our relationship with nature and the creatures is, that infuses your work can you talk more about the ways that you access these stories that's a really good question I think I access the stories in lots of different ways. Um, so one is the processes I talked about in the talk, which is um, the kind of going into the well and they just sort of come in. So I don't necessarily have a lot of control over that part. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I grew up uh, outside a lot. I, um, my dad took me fishing in Alaska. So we were out in the wilderness a lot. Um, I did a lot of like un scuba diving and things like that underwater and a lot of camping and um, we were just outside a lot. So, um, and then I just see um, just things are so beautiful <laughs> and a lot of it is about beauty. And then, you know, when you learn about something is that be something draws you in because it's so beautiful and then you kind of learn the stories around that thing as they continue to come into your life. Mm, That's so what happened for me. <laughs> really, the connection through time. I heard. I really want to hear more about that. Um, that process of um, getting talking about the deep roots from the blanket twenty four twenty that um, your collective has been working on. I just. I think that's a really powerful um, process and project. Thank you. Yeah, that piece has been very interesting. Um, I've been working mostly with um, Shamika 
on that piece. And uh, <laughs> we had to wind all the lines and they had to be the same length or roughly, um, although not all of them were, which is kind of interesting. Um, but as you kind of walk one length, that's like a life. Um, so it was very, very interesting process. And to do it in community was um, pretty amazing. And cause more than um, just Shamika helped, uh, um, my wife Annette helped to set up the loom and um, Coley Gladney helped to get it all set up. And so there's just like, it's just such a, um, I love working with the collective on these things because it brings in even more ancestors, I guess. And it's um, it's pretty profound work. And then to have some time that where we're weaving, you know, so we took that, that big column of um, red threads and now we're weaving that into a blanket. So each one of those lives is either going to be a, 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 a weft or, or a strand going up or a strand going across. Um, and so that's pretty beautiful. And then we're imagining it as a gift for um, our descendants uh, 400 years from now. So it reaches to the past, the present, and the future. Mm. So powerful. Um, we have a question about that, uh, your collective in Olympia. Uh, are there more pieces from you and the collective coming aside from your forthcoming bronze work? Yeah, we are curating uh, some downtown window displays and we're gonna make a piece for that. And we're also soliciting other work for that. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, contact me through my email, or you can look up the Blackwell Red Thread Collective. We have a website where you can contact us through there. Um, it's re been really challenging to work collaboratively on actual stuff, um, not just like mind things <laughs> uh, during this COVID time, because we don't get to see each other very often. We have to be really careful. So, um, but we've been doing it and, you know, we have our calls when possible and we get together a few times outside or, you know, we double mask. And um, so when we actually started this collective was right before the pandemic. And so it kind of put a damper on things a little bit, but I feel like in some ways it's kind of made us more, um, we've had to be more sort of fluid and, uh, I don't know, just more creative on how we can work together. Um, yeah, that's really great. I know that it's difficult, uh, challenging for a, a lot of us in this time too. So finding those, finding the good weather now that it's here is really great. Um, there, uh, but that leads me to that, the next question, kind of back to your, your sculptural work too. Was there, um, more about your two dimensional work? How does it inform your sculptural work in clay and bronze? Can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, I think I use, a lot of times I use 2D work to, um, cause the touch drawing process is two dimensional. Um, I can like pull out an image from that that's 2D much easier than a 3D. And so sometimes I'll work through that image a couple of times, different ways. Um, maybe do a conversation, a Progoff style conversation with that image and then kind of collect and gather more things that need to go to make it a 3D image. Because I think for me anyway, 3D is much more, there's more going on for me. Um, I have to consider all the angles <laughs> and there has to be more, like I have to know more about what it is. Um, I feel like with 2D, I can, I can like not know necessarily and just kind of go toward it. But the 3D, I sort of, I'm, I just have to know more. Yeah. It's a different kind of conversation in a way. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. I, um, I researched a little bit about the Prograph um, writing and journaling method. It, it definitely seems like a, a deep journey and a deep work. You have to be really committed to um, get there. <laughs> 
have a, a question on um, your anticipated timeline for the bronze piece again to be installed downtown. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm super excited about it. I, I have been, this piece literally has been in process for like nine or 10 years. <laughs> so um, mostly because I found out about the Plinth project around then. And then uh, I just really wanted something there, but I didn't know what, and it had to be durable and clay is not durable and outside. And so there's this kind of like, what, am, how would I make something that would do the thing, but also be like, have the quality, the tactile quality of clay, because I love clay. I mean, I love clay. And so, uh, and I, I love how it feels like, like it has like life and there's not a lot of sculpture materials I feel that have life like that. Um, but I do feel bronze has it. <laughs> and so, but you know, it costs so much and there's just so many barriers. Um, plus I had to figure out what was worth turning into bronze like that was going to be big enough to actually hold its weight on a plinth like that um and so i really knew i wanted it to be a full scale person and that meant i had to figure out really what it was going to be <laughs> and that took a long time long story short it's going to be installed this june so uh yeah long journey but june congratulations truly Really remarkable. It, it, I had I was curious what part of the process actually test really tested your limits in that journey, and you seem to touch on that. It definitely was um, a long journey. Absolutely, <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of yeah. and, wow. And you have to. I mean, you have to really like something <laughs> to 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 do that, you know, you have to really want to invest in it. Otherwise it's, you know, it's cost too much and it takes too much time. And there's so much, you know, I have to go up to the foundry and take the parts and come back and work on the wax. You know, there's like, it has to be something you really, really, really want. <laughs> so. Yeah, it does. It's a, it's a test in a way you have to continue to want it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I have a question from an uh, attendee that how did your work change after you started using the well meditation that you described at the beginning? <laughs> uh, it changed everything. Yeah, it changed everything. Um, before the well, I was like trying to think up work and that is very challenging um, to just like sit and like think, <laughs> think it up <laughs> from like somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but the well, because it's a writing process and now when I added touch drawing, which was in, I think 2016, um, after I added like, yeah, the well allows for, um, kind of a loosening of the restrictions of like my thought process. I can, I can allow other elements. I mean, it's hard to say, is it me or is it not me? I kind of go towards, it's not just me because it doesn't feel like me. Um, and it's this interesting collaboration. So when you collaborate, there's a lot more like stuff moving around and if you can kind of um, be open to the to the dialogue that happens, then mm -hmm. it's easier to come up with images. I mean, I have <laughs> I have more than I could ever make. You know, I don't have to like um, worry so much about whether I'm going to make something good. I kind of don't really care if it's good. I really would like it to be good, but. I feel like it's just the work that has to be made and I'm just going to make it. And, um, I do feel like there, sometimes there's like a download that happens in the well. So maybe I'm like at a place where I've just finished a big body of work and it's time to kind of like figure out what I, where I want to be going next. Um, yeah, then I might get kind of a download of like, 
eight pieces all at one time um, through the well process. And they all like kind of relate to each other. I'm sure you saw the ways that like the things just continue to come through in different ways. Um, so yeah, I'm still making this, I'm still making work that I made from before Progoff and touch drawing, but now, now it looks completely different. That's great. And uh, thanks for sharing that. It, it's not a mutually ex exclusive process. It, it's all related. Yeah. And then related to that process, someone wants to know, um, how you learned a, about the Progoff intensive journal process. <laughs> My mom, <laughs> my mom's an artist also. She's a book artist, paper artist. Um, and so uh, a while back, she took me a long while back. <laughs> um, I think it was when I was about to graduate from college. Um, so long while, like 20 years ago, uh, more, I don't know. Anyway, a while ago. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, she took me to a workshop because I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after college. And I just, I just didn't know. And this, this um, journaling style um, has a lot of prompts and it's geared toward allowing you to discover what it is that you want and like your currents in your life um, and that already exist that you've already been on, but you just haven't like either you they're not clear or um there's too many other distractions but it helps you to focus on the things that need to happen in your life um and it's all your own personal it's like you don't have to get um you know advice from a counselor you actually know already what it is <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of being you know following it and seeing it and so progoff really helps to do that and it uncovers things in your subconscious that need to come forward so it's um it's a very transformational process i've done it a lot with students and a lot of people really uh find it it's very challenging because it's not easy <laughs> um but it's very rewarding as well so. yeah. Yeah, definitely. That deep work is very rewarding on multiple levels, not just with with the art and um and, and talking about your mother and in that moment of learning about the Prograph journaling method. It, I was wondering if there was a defining moment that you can remember that um, moved you to the evolution of working with clay as, as a what was it? if you can pinpoint it. No. I think there were two really. <laughs> One has to do with Progoff. I went to that journaling workshop and Clay, I had a conversation with Clay. I didn't even think Clay was a thing that I was going to really do, but I had like dabbled in it a little tiny bit. And it was like, oh no, like this is your life and you don't even know it. And I can't believe you don't know it. It was super sassy and like <laughs> telling me that I was just like on the wrong path. It didn't even know why I was. <laughs> so. I was very surprised <laughs> and I was like, wow, this, that's, that's really something. Um, the other one was a little before that. And I, uh, when I was like very first started just even touching clay, I worked in this um, basement of a old gym at Grinnell college that was um, students taught the classes. They weren't like taught by the professors. They were like, they cost $30 for the quarter. And it was in an old locker room that smelled like dirty socks. <laughs> and I went down there um, to throw and on the wheel. And I was so captivated by it that uh, one time I had been down there for hours. Like, I don't even know how many hours. And I stood up and realized that I was like super sick. Like I had a fever. And, like, I was very sick. And then I had to walk home in the snow. It was like three feet of snow. So at that point I was like, you know, Clay, you know, it might be a thing. I don't know. So, and then the Progoff really put a, put a nail in it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Definitely. Um, there's a question. It says, when you were in, 
when you're engaged in such an intuitive process, how do you organize the offerings and learnings you access? Is there left brain analytical or structured work that you would say like supports you or is your foundation? Intuitive process to organize that. I would say to that, that I read a lot. That's, I guess, my left brain part of it. Um, I, I really love to read. I listen to audiobooks while I work. And so um, I just read a little while ago, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a profound book. If you haven't read it, please do. And um, that's where the more than human ancestors and relatives comes from, because I just, um, it was very moving. And um, so, yeah, I listen to, I, I read a lot of like Octavia Butler, which, um, you know, it helps me to like place myself that I'm not just myself thinking in these other realms and ways. There are other scholars doing the same thing um, and have been for a long time um, in the black community and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I just, um, I think finding and working with my collective as well, um, I think finding like the people that I can um, connect to really helps like give me a found some more solid foundation for otherwise, you know, I might be like drifting around, not knowing if I was really doing anything, <laughs> but since I'm in the stream, it feels like I am doing something. So, yeah. Those are really precious connections. Truly. He's a, it's a really interesting that braiding uh, sweet grass, that the, the science and the, the spiritual, the domestic, part of it and the nature part of it. it it's just integrated so deeply in your work I, I can definitely um, see that as a, a great an inspiration definitely read that um, I I uh, wanted to know if if I could ask an, another question I know we're running a little short on time but we we're doing great it's um, um let me see why do you why do you feel like now is a a critical moment for the for public and, and accessible art and in and, and within the uh, context of, and the work that you know acknowledging the uh, dehumanization and uh, through through word and image that's uh, taken place so, and and continuing that kind of why do you feel like now is a critical moment? Yeah, I think now is a critical moment. <laughs> I think, um, for one, I think art Im can impact us in ways that um, other things can't. So, um, and, you know, art at, at, at its best is very moving and images kind of stick in your brain. Uh, at least they do for me um, in different ways than like, other kinds of things do. Um, and we really need that impact right now, I think. Um, I think we're at this kind of crucial point in our country. Um, <laughs> super crucial point in our country's history. And we kind of can go like a couple of different ways. And I really, um, I really hope that we can go the way that we need to go to um, to reckon with the past and acknowledge what happened and what continues to happen, what's happening currently. Um, Cause I think there's possibility and potential for reconciliation, but I, for a lot of things, there's a lot of, a lot of history, a lot of wrongs um, that could be righted. Um, also we're at this critical place with our planet. It's, um, <laughs> It's dire, I feel. I feel it's dire. I have this kind of sense of um, dread, <laughs> existential dread um, that I'm trying so hard to balance with hope. And I think that um, the future is gonna require us to learn very quickly 
um, from our past mistakes and that we've made toward our planet, um, as well as uh, people and um, our more than human ancestors um, that live on this planet. And I'm wondering if we, I'm really hoping we can learn fast enough to survive as a species. I know that maybe sounds like doom and gloom, but I, I really don't think so. I think we're at that place, you know? Um, and I want to know if we can do that while valuing all life and honoring each being's contribution and um, to the way that our lives are interconnected and recognizing that those interconnections and I hope that it's not going to be um, just the survival of those who've been who have created institutions that value certain people over others um, and dominance of the earth and the beings that live on on our beautiful planet. Mm -hmm. So I'm like balancing hope and despair. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that and, and allowing us the opportunity to support and partner with you. I know that artists are truly uh, revealing much of this work that we're em embarking upon and, and wanting to do and needing to learn more and see it through a lot of different lenses. So um, thank you for sharing that. It's great. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and um, Thank you all for sharing this time with us. Is there anything, Aisha, that you want to say or an ending or, or share before we close? <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for coming. And um, there's just a lot of work to be done. And I hope we can all um, put in toward that, toward that work. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your process and and congratulations on that work. I, I know it's a powerful piece and it will remain that way. And I, and I really thank you. Can't, can't wait to see it. And I just, yeah, thanks so much for your time and willingness to share your journey. And, and be sure to, or for our audience, to connect to a Aisha and her her website. I'm going to put that on at the end of our program and um, see what you know she's been up to and and things that we've discussed today with the collective and um, yeah this is this is just a great way to kick off the lectures and the momentum program and thank you all thanks to our sponsors and members and donors like you. And yeah, okay, we'll see you next time. Bye.